our Your Health segment, where you're joined by Dr. Emerson Wickwire, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Medicine and Director of the Insomnia Program at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Let's start with the, the scope of the problem. I'm guessing there are a lot of people who have occasional difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep, and there are probably some people who have trouble all the time. True? Jeff, in the United States today, we are facing an epidemic of insufficient and disordered sleep. On any given night, three or four out of 10 Americans are experiencing a poor night's sleep. And for up to 70 million Americans, that's about one out of five adults, they're suffering a chronic sleep disorder that requires medical attention. The sleep disorders are associated with a range of negative health complaints from obesity to diabetes, heart attack to stroke, depression to dementia to premature death, and they're also associated with massive societal costs. Um, what's a correlate to? Is there an age at which people sleep well? Is there an age at which the, the, um, maybe the medical problems that you mentioned start to mount, and that causes trouble sleeping? Sure. So. As we age, our sleep does change, and in older adults, the base rates of sleep complaints, both insomnia and also what's called obstructive sleep apnea, which you can think about as more severe snoring, increase. That being said, we really see sleep disorders across the lifespan, ranging from infancy through childhood and adolescence, young adulthood, all the way up to late life. I want to talk about all of the factors that, that you brought up, but how about our sort of hyperactive lifestyles these days. You constantly you have your head in a, in a cell phone or a tablet or in front of the TV, or possibly you're doing all three of those things at, at the same time, and then you expect to get into bed and start uh, sawing wood or whatever the expression is. It doesn't help. Uh, all of the cognitive activity, uh, a friend calls it cognitive popcorn, where we are permanently connected to the TV and the phone and so on and so forth. For those of our viewers, of your viewers who are watching this evening, hoping to get a good night's sleep, the single most important expression that I could offer is think dusk. You think about we have uh, uh, dawn and a sunrise and a day and a sunset uh, and a dusk and a sunset and a night, but these days with electronic stimulation, generally what most people fall into is Day, 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 crash. So, really so, so maybe an hour before bedtime, you turn off the, uh, hit the power button, pick up a book, go old school? It absolutely could be. Uh, it could be a book. For folks who really enjoy television, um, uh, it could be a black and white movie. But, Jeff, I've talked to thousands, maybe tens of thousands of folks about their sleep, and I've never met one for whom the news is relaxing. <laughs> well, I can understand it's not designed to be, to be relaxing. I mean, it's designed to be stimulative. I mean, television in, in general, That's it's, you're trying to be entertaining here. Absolutely right. And there's lots of blue light, which suppresses melatonin. You may have heard of melatonin. It's a sleep-inducing hormone or a sleep-associated hormone. So by watching television or being on your mobile device close to bedtime, you are actually counteracting your body's natural sleep system. Can we just, uh, you know, put some melatonin in the in the warm milk uh, right before bed? Doesn't doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. But many people try, and that's why you see it sold everywhere from Walmart to the gas station. Okay. What are the other mistakes that that people make? I'm thinking about uh, caffeine. Uh, what sort of meal? When they have it? Uh, exercise? When they do that? To talk about the easy fixes. Sure. Undoubtedly, there are, let's call them sleep interfering and sleep promoting behaviors. Uh, in terms of sleep interfering behaviors, you might think about having caffeine within six hours of bed or eating a heavy meal close to bed. This will activate the digestive process. If you eat something that's fried or uh, sugary uh, or high in fat or spicy and it gets the stomach acids going, this can negatively impact sleep. We've talked about being overly active uh, with electronic devices close to sleep. All of these can interfere with sleep. On the other hand, implementing a consistent soothing bedtime routine uh, uh, using foods that contain an amino acid called tryptophan. Uh, this would be turkey, for example, or even peanut butter. These can help induce sleep. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about sleep, 
Uh, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You could also tweet your questions. Our Twitter address is at MPT News. Let's spend a minute on sleep apnea. How uh, it's certainly a subset of sleep problems. How, how big is that? Sleep apnea is more common than asthma. Uh, it's a significant problem. And sleep apnea is arguably the most uh, uh, well-studied uh, sleep disorder. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that, but sleep apnea has been associated, as I mentioned earlier, with a range of medical uh, uh, comorbidities, uh, including heart attack and increased risk for stroke. Jeff, the easiest way to think about it is sleep apnea, which is a disorder for those who aren't aware, where the upper airway collapses during sleep, uh, but we're not aware of it. Is it right to think of it as really bad snoring? It is. Um, what I tell patients is, imagine if I were snoring. For example, you brought me on as a guest tonight, and I were just snoring. That were my normal way of that breathing. That would be discouraged, but go on. It, well, but it, that's what sleep apnea is. Somehow we've been fooled into thinking that snoring during sleep is a sign of good sleep, or it's a sign of healthy, restful sleep. But it's not. It's no different than if I were snoring uh, while I were awake and talking to you. You'd say, call the ambulance. All right, so we'll come back to some of the uh, the treatments and how to diagnose that in a sleep lab. Uh, let's go out to Baltimore City. This is Bridget. Bridget, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Hi, I wanted to know what natural things, I don't want to take sleeping pills, what would you recommend um, for sleep? What, what are you, um, what, what's the problem, if I can ask? Well, I have diabetes, um, and I don't sleep at all. Huh? I'm resting, but I'm not asleep. So I, I attribute it to insomnia. I haven't been um, actually diagnosed. I'm saying is insomnia, but um, nothing. <laughs> I ha well, I want, I, like I said, I don't want to use a sleeping pills. So I, I you know, wanted to... Some you know, advice on what natural things to use. Bridget, thank you so much for calling. Great question. We'll get you an answer on the air. What would you say? There is some evidence suggesting that uh, an herbal root called valerian can help improve sleep. Uh, melatonin generally will not help improve sleep in situations like uh, that of the caller. Uh, I'd be remiss not to point out that the most effective treatment for chronic insomnia, uh, whether that's occurring with diabetes or another medical condition, uh, is a very specific sleep training program called CBT, uh, or cognitive behavioral treatment. But for now, we'll just call it sleep training. This is more effective than uh, prescription sleep medications. It's also more effective than natural remedies. What happens in that training? Well, the first thing that we do is we want to really understand the cause of the problem. Earlier before we started, you asked about uh, someone that you'd heard of taking a sleep medication for over 10 years. In a situation like that, we're really probably just treating the symptom. And the most important thing for us to do, especially as sleep disorder specialists, is to identify the cause. Uh, in terms of insomnia and CBT, Jeff, what I tell patients is you've gotten a lot of practice at being a lousy sleeper and you've really gotten quite good at it. So we need to retrain your body how to sleep. This is a very brief behavioral training program. I see, for example, most patients for six or fewer treatment visits. The the um, over-the-counter the over the over sleep aids that I'm guessing Bridget was leery of, I guess you're leery because you don't want to get hooked uh, they have a reputation of knocking you out for long periods. Is there anything over the counter that you would ever recommend? Generally not. The U.S. FDA uh, doesn't regulate these substances. There was just, and you may have seen it, a popular press headline uh, where um, uh, pharmacologists had gone and actually broken down the natural substances that you buy over the counter, and 80% of these weren't even what they didn't even contain the ingredient that they advertised. Okay, we have a ton of calls, but but on the on the prescription meds. Yes. When would you recommend one of those? The American Academy of Sleep Medicine advises uh, even when medications are being taken to add behavioral treatments, and it's because no pill can teach your body how to sleep. Okay, let's talk to Betty in Fairfax County, Virginia. Betty, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Hi, I was wondering if there's any research that shows marijuana use is helpful for sleeping. Great question. Thank you so much. 
Anything there? Actually, uh, marijuana withdrawal can negatively impact sleep, uh, and disturbed sleep can be one of the major predictors of relapse, not only to marijuana, but also to alcohol and other substances. Uh, patients who use marijuana to help them sleep, uh, in my experience, uh, they are self-medicating uh, perhaps an anxiety condition that the marijuana relieves, and therefore they, um, uh, they describe that they can sleep more easily. How about a glass of wine? Alcohol will make you fall asleep faster, and after that, it will ruin virtually everything about your sleep. It changes the distribution of what we call sleep stages, Jeff, which is a very structured, rhythmic way that our brain restores itself during the night. And uh, alcohol will also relax the breathing muscles to induce sleep apnea. Uh, if you're having trouble sleeping, having a drink is not the solution. Uh, let's talk to Don in Anne Arundel County. Don, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Uh, I'm 64 years old and uh, reasonably good health, and I never seem to sleep more than six hours each night. Is that normal, typical for my age? Don, what, what gets you up in the morning? Uh, you just wake up or your alarm clock goes off? I just wake up. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What's normal? On average, Americans, uh, adults, need just over eight hours of sleep. Now, there is a range, uh, of course. There are individual differences. My blanket answer, especially in a call-in situation, would be folks are not getting as much sleep as they probably should. We're all running around with uh, a degree of sleep debt. Now, six hours would be fairly short. Um, we would consider that uh, uh, in the short sleep range. There are folks who only, who only need six hours of sleep, but most folks are going to do better on more. Walk me through what's supposed to happen. Um, it's bedtime. Put your head on the pillow. You turn out the lights. Are you supposed to be out like that? Is there, is it, what's normal? Is it, is it normal to have a period of 10 or 15 minutes of thinking about your day and then you nod off and, and stay asleep for the whole night. Jeff, 10 to 15 minutes is well within the normal range. Typically, we think of 30 minutes as being a threshold for having trouble falling asleep or having trouble staying asleep. In other words, if it takes you 30 minutes to fall asleep or if you're awake a total of 30 minutes during the night, this would be more of a red flag if that problem happens uh, uh, in an ongoing way. All right, let's go old school here. What, what about... So, so you're laying there, and it's been 15 minutes, and maybe it's approaching 30 minutes, and you heard Dr. Wickwire say that's a problem, so now you're watching the clock. I, all right, I'll try counting sheep. What, does any, any stuff like that work? Generally not. And first thing I'd encourage you to do, Jeff, is turn the clock around for exactly the reason that you mentioned. Because when you look at the clock, it's just a stress cue, and it actually uh, uh, awakens the uh, alerting regions of the brain, so now you're paying attention to one more thing. You really want to have your bedroom cool, dark, quiet, and uncluttered without exactly those kinds of environmental stimuli. It is one of those things, and there's a number of these things, where in life, if you are thinking about it, it's not going to work right. Sleep is like a slippery fish. The harder that I try to grab it, the more it jumps away. So in a certain way, sleep is very much an act of letting go or surrender even. So, yeah, and, and you're, you're, um, you're thinking about, I need to get to sleep, I need to get to sleep, especially if you have to get up early in the morning for some particular function. And that, that ramps up the pressure. What do you do in those situations? You're describing what's called anticipatory insomnia. We've all had it where we had to make an early flight or maybe we had an important meeting or a presentation uh, or a child's uh, sporting event or whatever it may be in the morning. In general, if that only happens once, um, it's probably not a big deal. We're more concerned when it develops into an ongoing pattern. I've certainly had patients over the years who did not want to be taking sleep medications, but they knew because they had a community to D.C. on Monday morning, that Sunday night was always a rough night. Maybe that was the night that they took a sleeping pill. All right, let's go back to the phones. Baltimore County, this is Terry. Terry, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Yeah, how are you doing? Thank you for taking my call. You bet. Uh, I'm 75. I retired in 2004, and I had a stent put, and I, I'm taking a lot of medicine, vinegar, Cadwood. In the nighttime, I'm taking like a Flomex. 
Uh, is that have to do with my sleeping disorder or maybe something wrong with me? Great question, Terry. Thank you, sir. I, I can't address the specific medical questions uh, for the caller, but there are many medicines that can be insomnogenic or actually cause medications. It's one reason why it's important to work with uh, a sleep disorder specialist who's familiar with all of those potential side effects. Um, if, if I heard correctly, the caller is actually taking a medication uh, to reduce the frequency of urination uh, during the night, so certainly um, that's another factor that could impact sleep. How can it get so bad that, that, that um, Michael Jackson winds up being anesthetized? And obviously that was a complicated situation, but are there other people who, who have it that bad? There are. Uh, in fact, uh, Heath Ledger died under what appeared to be similar circumstances where he was really self-medicating in an inappropriate way uh, with opiates and uh, other painkillers and so on and so forth to try and get a good night's sleep. Now, those instances are certainly rare, but I think that they're reflective of the fact that we don't fully understand, appreciate, or act upon the importance of disturbed sleep. When, when should somebody uh, seek some help? If someone is wondering, should I seek some help, it's probably past the point where ask. Uh, uh, having a thorough assessment, even if you end up with a clean bill of health, uh, is good uh, uh, to ease the conscience and, and therefore get a good night's sleep. Uh, Anita in Prince George's County. Anita, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Yes. Um, hi. Thanks for hi. taking my call. You bet. Um, I'm um, HIV positive, but I'm undetectable. Um, in the past two days, I haven't slept. I've been telling my doctor I don't sleep. Is, is it because of my condition, or am I depressed, or, or I just need help, you know, because I don't sleep unless I'm taking something, you know, and I know that's not the answer. Anita, thank you so much for the phone call. Hope hope you feel better and uh, obviously see your own doctor for specific advice. There's uh, no direct reason that HIV would cause two nights of sleeplessness, although patients with HIV uh, do report sleep disturbances. Uh, you mentioned, the caller mentioned uh, depression, and certainly sleep disturbances are uh, part and parcel of depressive and mood disorders. What's supposed to be happening, what's it called, REM sleep? Yes. Uh, how much of the time are you supposed to be in that? Roughly 20%, and that actually maintains a fairly constant level throughout the lifespan. Um, whenever patients ask very detailed-oriented questions like that, I always caution them not to obsess about the percentages because they're somewhat plastic, and even within a given individual, our brains and bodies can adapt and adjust. Let's talk to Jack in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. Jack, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Yes, two questions. Uh, I'd like for the doctor to discuss central, central sleep apnea and what can be done about it. That's one. And two, head trauma and associated dreams that cause people not to get good sleep. Wow. Thank you very much. When we have difficulty breathing, it's generally for one of two reasons. We talked briefly earlier about obstructive sleep apnea, which is a condition where the upper airway begins to close during sleep. Central sleep apnea is a condition where the breathing muscles never get a signal from the brain. So in obstructive sleep apnea, we're trying to breathe but can't. In central sleep apnea, we actually never even begin to try to breathe. Uh, there are several treatments, uh, but the most common involves sleeping with a special device that regulates the air pressure as we breathe during sleep. That's a mask. That's a mask. Right. That's a mask. It's a gentle mask. Uh, it, uh, it has a, a variable level of air pressure to help keep our, our system moving. Okay. Um, let me look at a Twitter question. This is from Nancy. Where can we get CBT info or classes? That was the sleep training. That's right. Certainly, if you call the Sleep Disorder Center at the Midtown campus at the University of Maryland, um, uh, we'd be happy to answer questions. You can also visit the Society for Behavioral Sleep Medicine. That's behavioralsleep.org. The University of Maryland's website is umm.edu slash sleep. That's umm.edu slash sleep. What happens in the lab there? So you have a sleep lab? 
We do. We have uh, a number of beds. Uh, it's based in the hospital. It's very comfortable. We actually just moved. It's private. It's not like a dorm. It's right? not yeah. like a dorm <laughs> at all. Uh, it's it's more like a hotel than a dorm, but the reality is it isn't a hospital. It'll be as comfortable as it possibly can be, but you're not sleeping in your own bed. Uh, and during what we call an overnight sleep study, we measure many bodily functions. This test is called a polysomnogram, poly for many, somnos for sleep. So we look at things like brain activity, how hard you're trying to breathe, your heart rate, the oxygen in your blood, muscle movements, and other factors that let us know how well you're sleeping. Can you bring your own pillow? We encourage you to bring your own <laughs> pillow. Now, what about all the ads you see from uh, you know, mattress stores that, that this specific kind of mattress or this specific kind of pillow is going to make a difference? Any, any truth? Do you, have you seen any patients who went out and, and spent the money on a new mattress who were either satisfied or unsatisfied with it? Roughly an equal number of both, Jeff. But the fact is, your bedroom should be a sacred environment for sleep. And although that sounds very simple, uh, I mentioned earlier that your bedroom should be cool, dark, quiet, and uncluttered, it's actually a little bit more complicated for many patients to put that together. Uh, and certainly you need comfortable bedding, including mattress, pillows, uh, sheets, blankets, so on and so forth. Bed should be something that you look forward to. Sh sleep should be a pleasant, restful experience. I wonder if this isn't an area that's especially conducive uh, to the placebo effect of whatever it is, whether it's the new mattress, the new comforter, the, uh, the pill. If you did placebo testing on a little sugar pill, I bet it would work great for sleep problems? It, it works about 30% of the time for medical problems, uh, period. Uh, the right. placebo effect is very, very powerful. But and in sleep, is it more powerful? Uh, I'm unaware of any studies we'll looking at, ex at exactly yeah. that question. There's no money behind testing that. <laughs> That's right. not, not, for, not for the placebo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Baltimore County, this is Brenda. Brenda, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Hi. I've been diagnosed with, first they said it was narcolepsy, but they changed it to hyposomnolence because I get very little REM sleep. Question, are my cells being restored because I get so little REM sleep? Also, um, I'm concerned because my sleep specialist is refuting everything that I have researched and my experience about the ancillary symptoms. Um, my sleep medicine tremendously helps my concentration my focus. I was not even able to be organized before that, and I also lose muscle tone if I don't take it, or even if I'm taking it, uh, sometimes if I don't eat in the morning or if I eat sugar, I can be walking or running and actually trip and fall down. I have okay, let me get you an answer. Thanks very much for the phone call. Okay. I I heard the caller asking two questions. One is, well, what about possible narcolepsy or hypersomnia, I believe she was describing. Hypersomnia is a condition where I'm pathologically sleepy, so I'm very sleepy all the time, and we're not quite sure why. It's almost a definition of uh, exclusion, although recently there's been some genetic discovery uh, uh, in this area. Uh, the second question had to do just with working with your doctor in general. And what you should be looking for is a specialist whom you trust and whom you feel like you can ask difficult questions uh, and have meaningful conversations. So I'd encourage everyone to be a more proactive um, uh, consumer of health care services. What about people who have... Um a challenge because of their lifestyle or their job. They work split shifts and an odd schedule of some sort. What do you advise? Shift work sleep disorder is a massive problem in the United States. Um, Jeff's shift work sleep disorder really only exists in the United States and Japan. Earlier we talked about uh, being over-engaged and over-stimulated, uh, which is uh, epidemic in the United States. We have a 24-hour culture, and uh, shift work can be devastating. Shift workers get less sleep uh, than non-shift workers. In other words, if you work a traditional shift, you tend to get one to two hours more sleep than, for example, night shift workers. We're going to have to leave it there. Dr. Yeah. Emerson Wickwire is with the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Doctor, thanks for the visit. Thanks very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.